بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ونصلي ونسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين We begin this two-day program as we begin all of the things that we do of importance by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by sending salutations upon his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and upon his family and upon his companions. And I'd also like to start by just welcoming all of you and by thanking all of you for coming and taking the time. Some of you have come from very far away. And you should take a glad tiding in this regard that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said whoever seeks out a path in which he is learning or striving to learn beneficial knowledge in the religion Allah Azza wa Jal makes his path to Jannah easy and the angels lower their wings out of pleasure and out of contentment over what that individual is doing so you should take glad tidings that you've come here with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to learn beneficial knowledge and for us together to learn something which is going to benefit us in this dunya and in the akhirah bi idnillahi tabaraka wa ta'ala and we'd also like to extend our thanks to the brothers the organizers regarding the masjid and the facilities jazahumullahu khaira they have given their facilities and their time in order for us to be able to hold this event here today so we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make it uh, on the scale of their good deeds on the day of judgment just as we extend our thanks to the brothers who have come with all of the equipment the audio equipment and the camera equipment so that this message and so that this knowledge can be shared with as many people as possible with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I'd like to start by just introducing myself and the reason I'd like to introduce myself is I think it's very important ya ikhwan, that we take a principle when we learn knowledge of the religion and it is that principle look at who you are taking this knowledge from so it's important that you know the people who are talking to you here today where they come from the limits of what they know the kind of experience they have so that you can evaluate that and so that you can bear that in mind when you get the information that you receive from us today so as for myself i think most of you will know me already most of you will have seen me here in dudley or in birmingham uh, previous lectures and my name is muhammad tim humble i became muslim at the age of 14 years old and I went to the Islamic University of Medina in 2004, spent two years graduating from the faculty or the department of Arabic language and then from the faculty of Hadith from which I graduated in 2011. I first learned the knowledge of Ruqya from our Shaykh Ali bin Ghazi at Tuwajiri Hafizahullah Ta'ala one of the mashayikh, a professor of tafsir and a teacher of Aqidah in the University of Medina and I think I've mentioned the story before but I'll just sort of mention it to you again that my first introduction to Rukia was when a friend of mine asked me a question and I was in the Islamic University so they used to like to ask questions to pass them on to the Shiyu so he asked me a question about his sister who became very sick when she had gotten married within a few days of her marriage she became very very ill and so he asked me why she or what I knew about this and what could be done and I went and I began to research the topic and as I began to research the topic the topic of magic came up the topic of the jinn came up the topic of the evil eye came up and I put this question to Sheikh Ali bin Ghazi Hafizahullah who himself was a Raqi for many years and he began to teach me some of the introductory sciences and the knowledge that you need to perform Ruqya and bi-idhnillahi ta'ala some of that will be here uh, in the course today including some excerpts from his book Seeking a Cure from the Noble Quran I started practicing Rukia in around 2007 
And of course you know by now that I've delivered a number of lectures on the topic and I hold regular Rukia clinics usually in Newcastle upon Tyne and also elsewhere uh, and travel uh, for the purpose of teaching and informing people about this topic and about other topics. Very recently I completed a sitting with our Sheikh Adil ibn Tahir al-Muqbil Hafidhahullahu ta'ala from Riyadh and this too was over a period of about a week and Sheikh Adil Hafidhahullah is one of the people in Riyadh who is responsible for catching magicians in Saudi Arabia that's his job he is the head of one of the departments in Riyadh for catching magicians and magic and he is one of the people that I have met that I have not met many people and perhaps I've not met anyone who has more knowledge of magic and how it happens than this Shaykh Hafizahullah Ta'ala. So again, we're going to integrate into the course some of the information from the Shaykh and some of his videos, which we're going to see insha'Allah Ta'ala as we progress on through the day. Bi idnillahi tabaraka wa ta'ala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Just building on what our brother Muhammad Tim has said, just introducing myself, not as, mashaAllah, knowledgeable as, or as studied as his brother. With regards to Ruqya, Alhamdulillah, um, our brother Muhammad was probably went into it a different way that I went into it. Uh, about five or six years ago, um, a close family member of mine was afflicted and this forced me into the field of Ruqya. It forced me into looking and studying and investigating the topic of black magic, evil eye, jinn possession. Um, SubhanAllah, back then, I think this topic of Ruqya wasn't as well known um, and it wasn't as widespread within our communities that people had this knowledge of Ruqya. An aunt of mine was afflicted and the first thing to do was to ask those brothers who we knew to be upon the, the da'wah of the Qur'an and the Sunnah where to go from here. So Alhamdulillah, um, a brother from the local community, he came and he performed Ruqya and this really blew me away seeing the power and the strength and the effects of the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Later on, alhamdulillah, I received my ijazah to do ruqya from uh, a sheikh in Pakistan, Iqbal Salafi. He runs a very well-known uh, ruqya clinic. Uh, alhamdulillah, I attended the same course as our brother with Sheikh Adil al-Muqbil, Hafizahullah. Um, I think you brothers will probably know me from the Diaries of an Exorcist series um, the intention of which is to bring Ruqya to the forefront of our minds so that our brothers and sisters we are aware and we know about this topic and so we can counter the effects of this evil. Alhamdulillah I perform Ruqya regularly um, sometimes five, five times in a week, five sessions in a week um, and one of my teachers actually sat next to me, Hafidhullah, he, the brother Muhammad Tim. He was a brother who really encouraged me to, to really step up and, and start performing this uh, on, on, on a wider scale. Um, Alhamdulillah, this type of attitude, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, is what we would like to pass on to you brothers and sisters here today. What do we expect from you? What do, you, what do we expect from you as attendees of this course? And inshallah, some ground rules as well. Just in respect of the masjid, if we can uh, make sure that there's no eating or drinking aside from water in this hall. Uh, the brothers here, alhamdulillah, they haven't charged us a penny. They've done this completely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if we can respect these facilities, please. If we can please ensure that when we give you a break, it will be 10 minutes, 15 minutes to stretch our legs, get some fresh air. If we can ensure that we stick to the timetable, please, so that there are no disruptions. We do have quite a lot of material to get through, inshallah. Um, Alhamdulillah, I've noticed a lot of you brothers have uh, pens and paper. It's very important to make notes on this subject because you may have questions, you may have issues that you might not have known about, or you yourself might have something that you want to share with us, something that you know that we don't know. So Alhamdulillah, um, if we can keep things uh, written down, this will enable us to better digest and keep this knowledge, inshallah. Brothers and sisters, you're more than welcome to disagree with us. This is a field wherein 
we can't say absolute truth lies with me or absolute truth lies with you but please if you want to disagree where appropriate please do so with good etiquette please remember that this is a gathering of knowledge we need to have the correct etiquettes and mannerisms inshallah we want to make this a knowledge based on gather uh, on uh, sorry a gathering based on knowledge we don't want this to be just a load of stories a load of uh, jinn stories etc no we want to look at the ilm behind it as well this is a science as our brother has mentioned so there is knowledge behind this science so we want to look at the knowledge inshallah and upon that then we can base our own experiences and finally please do not keep this knowledge to yourself this is beneficial knowledge this is knowledge which subhanallah you might take it to one person and that knowledge might change his life you might take this to one person he might begin practicing ruqya and he will change other people's lives for the better with the permission of allah so please don't keep this knowledge to yourself please go out and spread this knowledge what you know what you feel confident to spread please go out and spread this knowledge Let's take a moment just to look, insha'Allah ta'ala, at what we're going to cover over the next two days. <laughs> One of the interesting things about Ruqya is that you can explain it so very quickly and you can also explain it in so much detail as well. The most basic concepts of Ruqya can be explained in a few moments. But insha'Allah ta'ala, what we want to give you is a real foundation. We're not going to give you everything. And there will be people sitting here today, I believe, who will have knowledge in this field in certain areas that we don't have. Please don't understand that we're sitting here today as teachers, as shuyukh, as people who are giving you knowledge. We're going to give you some knowledge. Some of you may know it, some of you may not know parts of it. But inshallah ta'ala, we, we believe and I certainly believe that there are many people today who will have parts of this knowledge that we don't have. And so what we're trying to do is to give you a good foundation in a wide range of topics related to Ruqya, including the jinn, including the evil eye, including the practice of reciting upon someone, including amulets and talismans and, and magical symbols and how magic is performed. And through this, inshallah ta'ala, everyone has a basic form of knowledge and from there you can progress, you can benefit from others, you can benefit from the shiyukh, from the tulab al-ilm, both in this country and outside, and inshallah ta'ala really develop your knowledge of this topic. In terms of the course, essentially what we've tried to do is to break the course into two parts, in the sense that the beginning of the course will be primarily theoretical. We're not going to be talking a great deal about ruqya as an action, as a practice today. Perhaps a very limited amount. But what we're going to be talking about today more than anything else is the theory behind it. The theory behind the jinn. We're going to be talking about what magic is, the essence of magic, what a magician is. How you can tell a magician from an ordinary person. How you can tell a magician from a so-called holy man. How you can understand the, the essence of the magical contract that exists between the magician and between the jinn. Amulets, talismans, magical symbols, what do they mean? What are all these squares and circles? By the end of this course, bi idnillahi ta'ala, you will be able to open any ta'weeth. And insha'Allah ta'ala, you will be able to understand what that ta'weed is saying, what it is meaning, and how it involves shirk and seeking help from other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As for tomorrow, bi idnillahi ta'ala, we're going to go more into the depth and the practice of ruqya. The raqi, who is the raqi? What does a raqi have to have within himself? Who can be qualified? What are the qualifications and the characteristics you need to be a raqi? The family of the Raqi, the household of the Raqi. How does the Raqi deal with himself in his household, with his family, with his ibadah, his coming close to Allah Azza wa Jal? How does he stop himself being harmed? And there is no way to stop yourself being harmed except by seeking refuge with Allah Azza wa Jal. How, and we're going to talk about all of these different things. The Ruqya session. How do you begin about 
performing ruqya upon somebody? What about if that person is a woman? How do you deal? How are things different in that situation? What are the do's and what are the don'ts? Prophetic and herbal medicine in ruqya. Just an introduction to some of the medicine of the Prophet wasallam that benefits us in the topic of ruqya. Some of the herbal medicine that benefits us, insha'Allah ta'ala, in the topic of ruqya. Innovations and bad practices. Subhanallah, as the more, you know, the more knowledge you get in this field, the more you will realize just how much misguidance there is in the field of Rukia and how many individuals there are who will come and they say, I'm a Raqi, I'm a Mu'alij, I cure people, I'm a healer. And those people are from a variety of different groups. Some of them are seeking the help of the Shaitan. Some of them have been fooled by the jinn and confused. Some of them simply do not know the difference between the truth and the falsehood. Some of them are simply fraudsters in it for money. Some of them are people who were sincere but the shaitan has taken away their intention. And some of them are practicing ruqya upon the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the guidance of the Salaf al-Salih Rahimahumullahu Ta'ala. So we're going to talk about those as well and then we're going to conclude. So we have 12 modules packed full of beneficial knowledge bi idnillahi ta'ala packed full of beneficial knowledge bi idnillahi ta'ala now again we emphasize and, and I, I want to emphasize again that you people will have you brothers and sisters you will have knowledge that we want to benefit from as well we're here to facilitate rather than to teach we're here to facilitate for you to inshallah ta'ala to get everyone on the same page to get some underlying principles, some basic knowledge, and then inshaAllah ta'ala for all of us to come together and to benefit each other and to cooperate upon al-birr wa taqwa, to cooperate upon piety and upon the fear of Allah Azza wa Jal. The first principle that we want to share with you today is an introductory principle that is not directly related to ruqya. But I always begin, always begin my talks on Rukia and on the jinn and on black magic and all of the other topics that we're talking about today by talking a little bit about the ghaib, about the unseen. Because this knowledge that we are talking about here today, a significant portion of what we're going to be talking about is from the knowledge of the unseen. And belief in the unseen is a fundamental characteristic of a Muslim. Allah Azza wa Jal at the very beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, what does he describe the Muflihun, the successful people? Alladheena yu'minuna bil ghaib. Those people who believe in the unseen. So your belief in the unseen, that there are things that you can't see with your own eyes and you can't hear them with your own ears and you can't touch them or get hold of them. But you believe in them because Allah Azza wa Jal, Al Alim Al Khabir, told you about them. And the Messenger of Allah, As Sadiq Al Masduq, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, told you about them. So belief in the unseen is a fundamental characteristic of a Muslim. How many people today, and I'm sure this will be a recurring topic over the next two days, say there is no such thing as jinn possession? Or they say that. All these people are afflicted with mental illnesses or they deny it to some extent or another. Ikhwan, we are from a people who believe in the unseen that Allah Azza wa Jal and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us about. And we believe that the knowledge of the unseen rests with Allah Azza wa Jal alone. As Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala tells us at the very end of Surah Luqman, indeed Allah alone has the knowledge of the hour. <laughs> and he sends down the rain and he knows what is in the wombs and no soul knows what it will earn tomorrow and no soul knows in what land it will die indeed Allah is all-knowing and all acquainted so this knowledge of the unseen it rests with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and Allah Azza wa Jal has informed us what he wished to inform us about and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has informed us what Allah Azza wa Jal commanded him to inform us about regarding this topic. But the important point that we want to really focus upon here is that the knowledge of the unseen 
the source of our knowledge of the unseen is what? The book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's not dreams. It's not holy people. It's not through ilham, like a kind of a revelation that you just appeared into your mind. The knowledge of the unseen, it comes from the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we understand it in accordance with the understanding of the Salaf al-Salih rahimahumullah, those pious predecessors from the companions and those who followed them in good. That is how we understand the ayat of the Qur'an and we understand the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as it relates to the unseen. So we are not going to take this knowledge from here and there and anywhere, but we're going to have a firm foundation when we're talking about things of the unseen, a firm foundation from the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Of course, there's no doubt that some of what we're going to talk about today is going to be based on experience, is going to be based on herbal medicine, is going to be based on some of the actions of the Sahaba and some of the actions of the Tabi'een. And that's okay, but we're going to distinguish between the difference. We're going to distinguish between what we have learned from experience and what we have learned from the source of revelation from the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And throughout this course, I want you to divide what you learn in your mind between those things that have a clear evidence for them from the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and those things which we suggest to you from our experience or which we suggest to you from some of the fatawa of the ulama or which we give you from some of the practices of the Salaf Rahimahumullah So I want you to distinguish between them so that you know what comes from the Qur'an and the Sunnah cannot be discussed, rejected, argued about, criticized in any way, shape or form. The only opinion of the believers when Allah Azza wa Jal and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam speak of a matter is to say we hear and we obey. What comes from the Qur'an and the Sunnah you do not have the right to disagree over. You do not have the right to question. You do not have the right to say well I think. When Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam speak of a matter, when Allah Azza wa Jal decrees a matter, our job is to say we hear, we obey, and we submit to it with a complete submission. As for the experience of the Raqi, you are free to form your own opinion about it. You're free to weigh it up against the evidences of the Quran and the Sunnah. Whatever you find is in agreement with the principles and the evidences of the Quran and the Sunnah, then take it. Whatever you find is other than that, then feel free to criticize, feel free with the manners and with the right etiquette to question and to form your own opinion about. But as for what we're going to tell you from the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then this is different from what the Raqi has experienced. And many problems people have in Ruqya can be solved by splitting this knowledge into these two parts. Because a Raqi comes and he says, I know the Qaba'il of the Jinn, I know all of the tribes of the Jinn, and I know the water Jinn and the air Jinn, and I know this Jinn and that Jinn, and I know this one and that one, and this herbal medicine and that one. These are all things that are beneficial knowledge from the experience of the Raqi and from whatever knowledge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed him with from his taqwa, insha'Allah. But this is different from what Allah Azza wa Jal and his Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. All you who believe, do not put anything in front of Allah and His Messenger. Do not put anything in front of the statement of Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Don't say the Prophet Sallallahu said to read the Mu'awwidatayn. My Raqi says the Mu'awwidatayn. Any the two last two surahs of the Quran, this is for the beginners. You should be reading this ayah. This ayah from Surah Al-A'raf, this ayah from Surah Al-Tawbah, this ayah from Surah Al-Shu'ara, this ayah from here and this ayah from there. Say, Jazakallahu khayran ya akhi, this is beneficial knowledge. But don't put anything, anything in front of the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam comes first in every single way. So we are going to benefit from experience. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam allowed the companions to do so in the topic of Ruqya. He said, show me your Ruqa, show me your Ruqya. 
and whatever was from it that did not contain shirk, he allowed it sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He allowed the companions to benefit from their experience. But at the same time, do not put this experience equal to qala Allahu wa qala Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah said and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. Ikhwani, why are we conducting this course? A Shaykh ibn Baz, rahimahullah, he said, as the level of Iman, it decreases, then the fitna and fasad within the society, they increase. This is one of the vices, this is one of the traps and the tricks and the plots of shaitan, is to indulge the people in sihar, is to invite the shayateen to possess the people. As the people, their iman decreases, and their distance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases, their level of openness, how open they are to possession, how open they are to sihr, this also goes up. And what we find is that this has led to a dramatic increase in the number of people who are suffering from the touch from the jinn possession, the number of people who are suffering from magic, the number of people who are suffering from evil eye. This has increased and is going to continue to increase because people, they are becoming more distanced from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, of course, if there's more people suffering, then we need more people to treat them. We need more people who are willing to do this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to treat and help their brothers and sisters. As our brother Muhammad Hafizullah has mentioned, that we have those people who are just fake. There are many fake Raqis in inverted commas who are using methods which are innovated. They are using methods which contain shirk. They are making pacts with the shayateen. These people, they only distance our brothers and sisters further from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They distance them further from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have those people who they are taking advantage of our brothers and sisters who are suffering. So our brothers and sisters are suffering and they go to somebody who they trust, somebody who they have turned to. They first turn to Allah, then they turn to this person to seek a cure. But subhanAllah, they charge them X amount of money. And we will talk about the issue of charging, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. But they charge them an extortionate rate. So these people are, you know, they, they, they're weighing in their gold, they're weighing in their jewelry, they're weighing in their possessions. And then subhanAllah, they're using this money to pay this individual. But this person is not even doing it according to the Quran and to the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We also have this cult of the Raqis. These Raqis who have, they have like a monopoly on the field of Ruqya. So when our brothers and sisters, we were not practicing Ruqya previously, there were those Raqis who were established and they had a monopoly on this field of Ruqya. And subhanallah, they make Ruqya look out to be like open heart surgery. Something which if you're not a companion or you're not at the level of a companion, then you can't do. Subhanallah. And this is so that they have this grip on the field of Ruqya so that subhanallah, their income is, is protected, their honor and their status, it is protected. But subhanallah, what we will see today once we've established these fundamentals, once we've established these ground rules, is that anyone, any believer who believes in Allah and the Messenger and he has Iman and he has a correct Aqeedah and he has Tawakkul ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then bi idhnillahi ta'ala, anyone can at least do ruqya upon themselves and their close family members, if not on the wider community. And inshallah, this is something that we will discuss later, bi-idhnillah. I wanted to now talk for a moment about the virtues of ruqya. And the reason that I want to talk about the virtues of ruqya and the virtues of being a raqi is that there is another, if you like, another, another cult or another wave of opinion that spreads around the people. And that is that this knowledge, leave it to the reciters, 
Leave it to those people who don't know anything about the religion. No talib ilm, no serious student of knowledge. He should be learning fiqh, he should be learning tafsir, he should be learning the Arabic language. Why are you leaving the people? Why are you wasting your time with this recitation over the people? And this is very, very, very common. And unfortunately, qaddar Allahu wa ma sha'a fa'al, we have even heard this from some of our shuyukh, some of the mashaykh. So I just wanted to take a moment for us to look about or to look at the virtues of this action, the virtues of this ruqya. So when someone comes to you and says, why do you busy yourself with this? Why are you wasting your time with this and these people? Why are you send, spending all of your time to help these people in this way? This is something that you know you could just leave it to give them a tape, give them a tape of Surah Al-Baqarah and tell them to go figure it out. No problem, why, why, why give your time for this knowledge? And we're going to talk about it through five points. Five points, five separate virtues. Wallahi, if one of these virtues alone was in Ruqya, it would be enough for you to make Ruqya one of your primary aims. But for all five of them, inshaAllah ta'ala, you'll see the virtue of this action and the virtue of this knowledge, inshaAllah ta'ala. The first one of these virtues, Ya Ikhwan, is calling people to Tawheed. Giving da'wah to the Qur'an and the Sunnah, propagating the da'wah of the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Usually what happens is the person who is suffering, he goes to everybody else. He goes to the person who, who will give him an amulet. He will go to the magician. He will even go to the non-Muslims seeking what? Seeking a quick fix. He's been to everybody else and nothing else has worked. So he comes to you and he is in the most desperate of situations. Perhaps he has already associated partners with Allah in his seeking of a cure. Maybe he's sacrificed for others besides Allah, maybe he has a da'weed around his neck, whatever it may be. But he's been to everybody and at this moment right now, perhaps he is on the doorstep of the fire of Jahannam. And he is in a desperate situation. So subhanAllah, your ruqya, the first thing is that you should be calling this individual to the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In my opinion, the Ruqya session, which does not involve da'wah at the beginning, is deficient. If he comes in and you just open the book of Allah and you begin reciting, this is good. But there is something missing. You have missed out on a golden opportunity to give this man da'wah and give him da'wah to Tawheed. To call him to the worship of Allah. To call him to rely solely upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahi ya ikhwan, when this person is in this state, this da'wah, this 10, 15, 20 minutes that you give him is more beneficial than a thousand lectures. He is going to sit there and he will be hanging off every single word that you say. He will be listening so attentively when you call him to Tawheed, it's going to take root in his heart bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. And Allah is the turner of the hearts, but we make dua. And at this moment, inshaAllah, your words are going to be extremely heavy, extremely effective in calling him to Tawheed. Look at the virtue of calling to Tawheed. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he sent Ali radiallahu an, he sent Ali to some people. He said, go to their open places and invite them to the worship of Allah alone. And he said, by Allah, that Allah guides just one of them is better for you than red camels. If Allah just guides one of them through you, O Ali, it's better for you than red camels. Red camels were worth a fortune in those days. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses you to put you in this situation, Blesses you to put you in the position of the prophets and the messengers. وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنْ اِعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ وَاجْتَنِبُوا الطَّاغُوتِ We sent to every nation a messenger saying, 
tell them to worship Allah, call the people, calling the people worship Allah and stay away from that which is worship besides them. You are treading on the footsteps or treading on the path of the prophets and the messengers. Call the people to Tawheed. You are calling the people to Tawheed. And this is a time when they will listen. This is a time when they will be attentive. So do not let a single Ruqya session pass you by except that you are calling to Tawheed. This is the first virtue of, giving, of, of doing Ruqya. The second virtue of Ruqya, Ya Ikhwan, is you will be reciting the Quran and you'll be in a state of the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said the best of you are those who learn the Quran and then they teach it. What about the one who he sits there and he says, Akhi recite Surah Al-Fatiha, Akhi recite Ayatul Kursi and he is reciting it himself. For every single letter that he recites, he is getting 10 good deeds. And the Messenger alayhi salam, he said that Alif Lam Meem is not one letter. Rather, Alif is a letter, Lam is a letter, and Meem is a letter. So you open the book of Allah and you recite Surah Al Fatiha. Imagine how many good deeds you are getting just by reciting the Quran. Imagine how many good deeds if you do recitation for one hour. Subhanallah, imagine how many good deeds will be written for you with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet alayhi salatu salam, he said, Shall I not inform you of the best of the deeds and the purest of them with your Lord? The deed that is better for you than spending gold and silver and which is better for you than to meet your enemy and that you strike their neck and they strike your neck. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it is the remembrance of Allah. SubhanAllah. Imagine this now. You are in a constant state of remembrance of Allah. You are calling this person to Tawheed. You are calling this person away from shirk. Maybe that da'wah will change that person's life. And as a result of that, maybe they weren't praying. And you give them da'wah, they start to pray five times a day. You will also receive their reward. On top of that, you open the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you are making dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Perhaps the angels will descend and listen and it will be written for you. Every single letter that you recite is 10 good deeds. Would you recite this much Quran on a normal day? Perhaps we wouldn't. But as a result of doing ruqya on ourselves and our families and on the wider community, we are reciting a lot of Qur'an. As the Salaf would say, if you want to know what your relationship with Allah is like, then look at your relationship with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe right now, our relationship with the book of Allah, the Qur'an, it is not as it should be. But imagine using this book of Allah, giving da'wah to it, calling others to it, and then using the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to seek a cure for our brothers and sisters who are suffering. This now takes me on to the third virtue of ruqya. It is helping your brother or sister in Islam. And this one hadith which is recorded in Sahih Muslim, it is enough for us. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, uh, sorry, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever relieves some grief from a believer in this world, Allah will relieve for him some of his grief in the hereafter. Whoever alleviates the financial or the difficulties of a needy person, Allah will alleviate his difficulties in this world and in the hereafter. Whoever conceals the faults of a Muslim, Allah will conceal his faults in the world and he hereafter. Now look, Allah continues to aid a servant so long as the servant aids his brother. Do you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to aid you on Yawm Al-Qiyamah? When the fire is in front of you, when the fire is in front of us and Jannah is on one side and Jahannam is on the other side and our good deeds are weighing us down and we need the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Perhaps because we aided our brother in the dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will aid us on that day and cause us to enter into Jannatul Firdaus al-A'la. And I will now hand over to our brother to mention some other virtues. We've heard three virtues. The first of which is calling the people to Tawheed. The job of the messengers alayhimu salatu salam. The Raqi is doing the job 
of the messengers alayhi salatu was salam. The virtue of reciting the Qur'an and the remembrance of Allah and that the best form of the remembrance of Allah is to recite the Qur'an. And the Raqi, I don't think there are many people with the exception of perhaps a Qur'an teacher who recites the Qur'an as much as a Raqi recites the Qur'an. And then the virtue of helping your brother and that Allah Azza wa Jal will help you. But that's not the end of the virtues of Ruqya and the virtues of being a Raqi. From the great <coughs> virtues of being Iraqi and the virtues of Ruqya is that Ruqya is from the greatest forms of Jihad Fi Sabilillah. From the greatest forms of Jihad Fi Sabilillah. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said, for the Raqi is a Mujahid for the sake of Allah. He is a soldier for the sake of Allah. And this is from the greatest forms of Jihad. So he should be careful lest the enemy overcome him because of his sins. And Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said, it is not right that someone is scared of learning this knowledge of Ruqya. It's not right for someone to be scared of learning this knowledge of Ruqya and practicing it because it is an act of worship and it is jihad for the sake of Allah Ta'ala, the exalted. The servants of Allah who stick to his limits are within the safekeeping of Allah, his protection, his care and his preservation. Why is jihad from the, why is Ruqya from the greatest forms of jihad fi sabilillah? What is jihad fi sabilillah? To make the word of Allah Azza wa Jal the highest and to make the word of those who disbelieve the lowest. This is the purpose of jihad. Wallahi, the, the Ruqya fulfills this purpose as the other forms of jihad fulfill this purpose. The Raqi puts himself in danger. He puts himself in difficulty. He puts himself in struggle and strife for the sake of making the word of Allah Azza wa Jal the highest and making the word of those who disbelieve the lowest. The Raqi fights against the shaitan. If you think it is virtuous to take a weapon and fight against the enemies of Allah in this earth, then to fight against the shaitan and his plots is from the greatest of the forms of jihad. And to fight against the shaitan that has overtaken your brother and to fight against him physically with your hands and with your mouth and with your voice and with the recitation of the Quran and to struggle and to strive and to suffer in this way, this is from a jihad fi sabilillah and it is as Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said, it is from the greatest of al jihad fi sabilillah. The prophets and the salihun, the pious people who followed the prophets, they fought against the enemies of Allah Azza wa Jal. They fought against the enemies of Allah from the jinn and they fought against the enemies of Allah from the men. And likewise, they repelled the enemies of Allah with whatever they were able to repel them with. And likewise, we see that they repelled the enemies of Allah from the shayateen and from the jinn and that they consider this to be from the greatest forms of jihad fi sabilillah. You look at the example of Isa alayhi salam, the example of our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. They performed ruqya, they extracted, they fought to remove the shaitan from the body of the people, to fight against the enemies of Allah, those that we can see and those that we cannot see. So ruqya is from al jihadu fi sabilillah. And the final one that I want to finish with is the hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam regarding a group of people on the Day of Judgment. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and from them, i.e. from my Ummah, will be 70,000 people who will enter Paradise without any account and any punishment. No account, not even looking at your deeds. Without any account and without any punishment, they will enter Jannah on the fast track. While everyone else is waiting to talk about their minor sins and their major sins, they will enter Jannah in the fastest way. Those 70,000 people who will enter Jannah without any account and without any punishment whatsoever, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam described them. He said, "Humul الَّذِينَ لَا يَسْتَرْقُونَ they are those people who do not go around seeking Ruqya. 
Some of you may listen to this, and we're going to probably talk about this in the topic of Ruqya, that this doesn't mean that you shouldn't seek Ruqya or that people shouldn't seek Ruqya from you. But the highest level, the level of those people who have ultimate trust in Allah Azza wa Jal is that they rely on Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala and Allah Azza wa Jal alone. Like those companions who said the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took bay'ah from me. That if I fell from a camel, I would not reach out my hand for someone to pick me up. This is the level of the people who have complete tawheed and complete tawakkul upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, complete reliance in Allah azza wa jal. They are those people who do not unnecessarily without any need go from person to person to person. You help me, akhi, help me, akhi, help me, akhi. I need you to do, read on me, please do something for me. The best of the best of the best are those people who they trust in Allah azza wa jal completely. They do not seek ruqya. وَلَا يَتَطَيَّرُونَ And they do not heed omens. Black cats, mirrors, walking under a ladder. They لَا يَتَطَيَّرُونَ they, they say, اللَّهُمَّ لَا طَيْرَ إِلَّا طَيْرُكُ وَلَا خَيْرَ إِلَّا خَيْرُكُ وَلَا إِلَهَ غَيْرُكُ Oh Allah, there is no omen except from you, your omen. And there is no good except from you. And there is no God worthy of worship except you. وَلَا يَكْتُونَ And they do not get cauterized. وَعَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ And upon their Lord they trust. This description of the Prophet ﷺ is not a comprehensive description. It, is, it does not mean that everyone who doesn't go to beg people for ruqya and doesn't believe in omens and doesn't get cauterized will be from these people. But it is a description of a kind of person. What kind of person? The kind of person who his Tawheed is as complete as a human being can have Tawheed. After the messengers and the prophets والسلام, A person whose trust is absolutely and totally upon Allah Azza wa Jal. Why did I mention this in the virtues of Ruqya? Who is the most deserving person of being from these people? The Raqi is from the most deserving people of being from these 70,000. And in case you are thinking that this number of 70,000 is too small, first of all, remember that the bounty of Allah is expansive. And that you should never ever limit the bounty of Allah. Like the Bedouin who came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, May Allah have mercy on me and you alone. He said, you have made something that is very expansive, very, very small. You have constricted something that was huge. Don't constrict the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal. Secondly, there is a narration that says with every 1,000 of the 70,000, there are 70,000 more. And in another narration, with every single one of the 70,000, there are 70,000 more. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make you from those people. And the Raqi is the most deserving of the people if he is a prone tawheed from being from those people of the 70,000. Why? Because he is the least likely of anyone to go and seek ruqya. He is the least likely of anyone to see an omen in anything. He is the least likely of anyone to have any deficiency in his tawakkul upon Allah because he lives and he dies upon the tawakkul of Allah he st spends time with shayateen enemies attacking him from every side that he can't even see. If it was not for the tawakkul of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the raqi would lose his mind after one ruqya session. You can't see your enemy and he is attacking you from every single side. And the only thing that you have is the trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the most deserving of people of being from these 70,000 and the 70,000 who accompany them, from those people are the ruqa, those people who perform ruqya, because they are the ones who have that ultimate trust in Allah Azza wa Jal. They live upon it, they die upon it. And they are those people who are the least likely of anyone to beg others to perform ruqya for them. And they are the most likely to trust in Allah Azza wa Jal without anyone and anything else. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from these 70,000. And then, we go over these five points. We go over these five points. First of all, that you are a da'i, a da'i, a calling the people to Tawheed. 
that you are a person who spends their day and their night in the remembrance of Allah Azza wa Jal. Your tongue is wet with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The best form of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the Quran. You spend your day and your night in helping your brothers. You spend your day and your night. You are a mujahid for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal from the greatest forms of jihad. And bi-idhnillahi ta'ala with complete trust and with dua and trust in Allah Azza wa Jal, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala, you will be from the 70,000 who will enter Jannah without any account and without any reckoning. And this is enough of a virtue that we can reply to those people who say, leave this to the Qurra, leave this to the Imam of the Masjid who just comes and reads the prayer five times a day. Don't busy yourself with this, busy yourself with fiqh, busy yourself with tafsir. Alhamdulillah, the knowledge of Islam is comprehensive. We need to give a time for everything. There is a time for this and a time for that. But give some of your time for this ruqya so that you can achieve these five virtues with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're going to finish.